down into the forms, dumping its load of 16 tons. Crews vibrated and compacted the fresh pours, while buckets returned again and again to the mixing plants to be filled with more concrete or other waiting forms. Crews worked under all conditions, all seasons of the year without cessation, rain or shine, day and night. By June 1934, one year after the first pour, two-thirds of the dam's concrete had been placed in the forms. Hoover Dam had risen to an impressive height, already taking its place as one of the world's wonders. As Hoover Dam climbed between its abutments, related structures also took form. At the toe of the dam, the U-shaped power plant to house generating equipment, control and maintenance facilities was built in twin wings, one along each side of the canyon walls. Intake towers, two on each side for the power plant's penstock system, climbed as a maze of reinforcing steel and concrete. Perched on shelves hewn in the canyon walls, these graceful columns rose 403 feet, well above the dam's crest and the canyon rims. Two giant spillways were set against the canyon walls on each side of the reservoir just above the dam. These high-level controls, each capable of bypassing 200,000 cubic feet of water per second, assure that no water will ever overtop the dam. Water flowing into the basins plunges downward through the spillway tunnels to enter the river below the dam. 100-foot-long drum gates on the spillway's crests rise during flood stage to give the reservoir an additional 16 feet of storage. Hoover Dam's penstock system called for pipes of unprecedented size, ranging from 8 and 1 half to 30 feet in diameter and 5 eighths to 2 and 3 quarters inches in thickness. As it was not possible to ship units of this size across country, steel plate was brought from eastern rolling mills. A steel fabrication plant, erected especially for this job near the dam site, rolled and assembled the nearly three miles of pipe installed in the canyon wall tunnels. As in all unprecedented phases of Hoover Dam's construction, fabrication of the pipe sections required special machinery and equipment. Edges of the dimension plates were shaped on a planing machine to assure precision and accuracy of later steps in their manufacture. Then, they were bent on a giant press and rolled into circular form. One such plate equaled one-third the complete circumference of a finished pipe. Three of the largest curved plates welded together formed a ring 30 feet in diameter and 11 feet long. Two of these rings joined made up a section weighing 150 to 184 tons. A vertical lathe machined the edges so the sections would fit precisely when joined into continuous penstocks inside the canyon walls. The train passing through one of the 30-foot sections reveals their comparative size. When the intake towers and their connected tunnels were ready to receive the penstocks, a specially designed trailer hauled the sections one at a time to the dam site. At the canyon rim, a 150-ton cableway relieved the trailer of its tremendous burdens, swung the pipe sections out over the gorge, and lowered them under absolute control. Trailers waiting at portals of the access tunnels carried them to their permanent connections inside the main tunnels. The pipe sections were hoisted into location with cables and joined end to end with pressure pins to form continuous conduits between the intake towers, turbines and outlet valves. While this and other work on the pertinent features was going on, a continuous stream of concrete had been pouring into the dam forms. The structure neared its full height of 726 feet, far above the crest of any other dam yet built by man. On May 29, 1935, 
two years after they had begun pouring, crews placed the last concrete in Hoover Dam, a total of three and one quarter million cubic yards. This modern civil engineering wonder stood completed two and one half years ahead of schedule. On September 30th, 1935, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt dedicated Hoover Dam to the nation's progress. He praised its designers and builders. The dam stood like a sentinel, white and beautiful in the desert sunlight, guarding the river and its downstream wealth. Floodwaters lapped helplessly against its arched back as the reservoir filled. This man-made inland sea spread into the valleys and canyons among the colorful hills and mountains. Hoover Dam had conquered the Colorado. Turbine pits to hold Hoover Dam's 17 big hydroelectric units were built into the powerhouse. Generator installations began in 1935. The first generator, Unit N2, began commercial operation October 26, 1936, to serve the city of Los Angeles. In ones and twos, the generators filled the pits as demand for electrical energy in California, Nevada, and Arizona called them into service. Finally, in 1959, manufacture and installation of the last generator, N8, began. For 25 years, the N8 pit had lain dormant silent, except for the hum of other Hoover generators. Now, as more generating capacity was needed, contracts were awarded for the generator's manufacture and installation. Plants throughout the nation fabricated N8's many parts. The design of N8 followed that of other Hoover generating units. It is a 95,000 kilowatt, 60 cycle, 16,500 volt generator driven by a 115,000 horsepower turbine. Falling water from the reservoir, which spins and powers the turbine wheel, is controlled by a huge butterfly valve, which permits the water to flow to the turbine from the feeder penstock. Weighing 2,000 tons, N8 parts were shipped to Hoover Dam on 60 rail cars. Arriving at the canyon rim overlooking the dam, the parts were lifted by cableway out over the canyon and down to the powerhouse. Parts descending into the gorge on strands of cable were familiar and almost daily sights, reminiscent of previous installations. And the main cableway operator was the same one who had helped install and operate the cableway during the dam's construction in the early 1930s. Others likewise had worked on the project throughout its construction. Inside the Nevada wing of the powerhouse, technicians assembled and installed the mass of electrical cargo. Crews prepared the N8 pit to receive the new generating unit. They removed temporary slabs over the turbine and relief valve outlets to the tail race or river. Liners assembled in these openings were set in concrete. The turbine's scroll case sections were lowered into the pit. The sections were leveled, bolted together, and aligned. The completed scroll case was then anchored in concrete. Later, the turbine's water wheel, attached to the bottom end of the shaft, was installed inside the case. The butterfly valve was assembled on the generator floor and later connected between the feeder penstock and the turbine's scroll case. Meanwhile, the generator's two main parts, the rotor and stator, took form. Steel lamination plates were stacked around the rotor and stator frames. Coils were locked into place and electrical connections were made. Powerhouse's overhead cranes lifted the completed 254-ton stator from its erection bay and carried it gently to its foundation over the turbine pit, where it was lowered and bolted into place. The 466-ton rotor was moved from its erection 